Let's start with chemicals. This is a ridiculously overcomplicated graphic. I blame the Europeans. On the right, you start with crude oil. You refine that into tens of thousands of daughter products we use every day with an intermediate step called naphtha. You usually do this through an oil refinery. Or on the right, you start with natural gas, same general process, but first you have an intermediate step called ethylene. Now, this relatively narrow product set, these are the things that normally you can only make from natural gas. But in the United States, where natural gas is really, really cheap, we use it to do all of this. That's everything from windows to sports equipment to insulation to glass to diapers to makeup to tires. So, you have the Haynesville next door, which is one of the world's great natural gas fields. These are all options. Every circle and square up there is something you could do. And if you don't want to, you can import the stuff from refineries nearby, whether it's New Orleans or Houston, and then do the next step into heavy industry and get into any of those products I just mentioned, plus about 10,000 others. The materials are all right here already. It's heavy manufacturing. You're not making a computer, but you will make the things that allow us to make absolutely everything that we use every day. The most fun of all of these is this little guy right here. That's fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer. So we've lost potash because of the Ukraine war. And because natural gas is so expensive everywhere, but here we're losing nitrogen very, very quickly. That's two of the three nutrients. We'll talk about the third one here in a minute. All right, let's say you don't like conventional oil and gas, although our industry report, that would be weird. Uh, but there are business opportunities and other things. What we're looking at here is what goes into an electric vehicle versus a normal vehicle. Now, a normal vehicle or a normal power plant, it's really pretty straightforward. You get the fuel in there, you light a match, you set it on fire, you capture the heat. Yes, 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 it's more complicated than that, but it's really, you know, this is old technology, we figured this out 150 years ago. But if you want electricity, you gotta do more, because the transmission and the storage, that's really involved in terms of engineering and materials. So this is the type of material that goes into EVs versus conventional vehicles an order of magnitude more complicated, more materials and more of them. Now we understand in our gut the pain and the complexity of a fossil fuel-based fuel system because you have to deal with Iran and Iraq and Venezuela and Russia. But if we want to do the green transition, if that is really our goal, then we need to deal with Canada and Mexico and Peru and Chile and Bolivia and Brazil and Argentina and South Africa and Gabon and Congo, and Eritrea, and Ethiopia, and Mozambique, and Australia, and Vietnam, and Indonesia, and Malaysia, and China, and Pakistan, and Turkey, and Mongolia, and Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan, and oh yeah, still Russia. You think oil geopolitics was a pain in the ass? You're not gonna mine lithium here. But every material has to be processed so it can be used. These are the, the 12 most common materials that go into the green revolution. We need to double the amount of copper. We need 10 times as much nickel and lithium. We need 18 times as much graphite. And processing all of that stuff takes power. Everything that is a red wedge up there is processed primarily in China, and it will be going to zero. We're never gonna do the green revolution, not at the scope and the speed that some people think. But we're gonna try, and we're gonna make some progress. And even if all we want is lithium batteries for our laptops and our phone, we're still gonna need more than we have right now because we're gonna lose a lot of what we have right now. And it has to be replaced, and it has to be processed somewhere with maritime access and cheap electricity. Any takers? All right, let's say you want something a little less exotic. You want good old-fashioned steel. 
Most countries follow the same process. You start on the left here, you get iron ore, you throw it into a blast furnace with usually a bunch of coal, you basically melt the crap out of it and burn off all the impurities. That leaves you with an intermediate product called pig iron, which is useless, but it's a necessary step. That pig iron is then processed on in a more advanced facility, often part of the same complex, into rolled steel. The hot rolled steel is the stuff that's structurally strong, but not necessarily resistant to corrosion, and it's kind of ugly. So it's your car frame or the rebar and concrete. Or the high-end stuff, the cold rolled, that's the shiny stuff. If you can see steel on anything in your watch, on a roof, that's cold rolled steel, much more expensive. Here in the United States, we don't do a lot of hot rolled steel in the traditional sense. We are the world's greatest steel recyclers. And about 95% of the steel that we use every day has already been used once, twice, 18 times. You can recycle it endlessly. But recycled steel can only be turned into hot rolled. You can't make it pretty, at least not yet. Cold rolled has to be made from pig iron. It has to be virgin steel. We don't do much with foundries. So what we do is we import someone else's pig iron and we turn it into the highest quality steel in the world, mostly for export. Three quarters of global pig iron came from Iraq, excuse me, wow, wrong war. Three quarters of global pig iron came from Russia and Ukraine. The Russian stuff is under sanction, we're not taking much of that into law anymore. That nuclear power plant in Ukraine we keep hearing about, that provided every electron of electricity that Ukraine's steel mills operated on. It's all gone. All that's left is Brazil, and there's not enough. So on top of everything else that you might be struggling with with inflation, we also have a steel shortage. The things you need to make steel, iron ore, and then coal or electricity might not be as sexy as chromium, but wow, we need a bunch of it. All right, let's say you wanna grow something instead of mine something. This is where the world's timber comes from. Anyone see a problem here? Russia, one way or another, is going away. Either it's gonna win this war and it's gonna be under crushing sanctions, or it's gonna lose this war and it's gonna fall apart. Either way, all of that goes away. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out there and cut down more trees, but this already is a harvesting zone, but because you're close to New Orleans, it is not a processing zone. I don't care if all you do is turn sawdust into pellets or make plywood or make furniture. The options are almost endless, and your proximity to population centers makes this perfect, because this is something Texas can't do because they don't have trees. Let's say you want to grow something you can eat. Here's corn. See a problem with Ukraine? Yeah. Now there is currently a UN managed export system that has safe haven pathways from the ports that allow the Ukrainians to export some grains. And they've been preferencing corn to this point because it is, there's more dollar per bushel in it. And they've got to choose what they ship out. So the wheat has basically gone to zero. Corn is actually up a little bit. But think about what the Russians are doing right now. The war is stalled, so they're using drones and missiles to target electrical infrastructure throughout the Ukrainian system, causing power outages, trying to cause as many deaths as possible. What do you think they're gonna do once summer happens? There's no point in going after the power infrastructure then. They're gonna go after the agricultural infrastructure. This is also going to zero. Now again, I'm not saying go out there and grow more corn, but anything you can do to add value, especially to a sector where you know the world is about to lose one of its major producers, whether you're making grits or pressing it into oil, same logic holds true for soy, same holds true for cotton and cotton seed. There's very little agricultural processing that happens within 500 miles of you. On one side of you, you've got Atlanta, on the other, you've got the Texas Triangle. Ravenous urban zones that need every scrap of value-added commodity they can possibly get their hands on. 